Our guest today is Adam Grant, a management professor at Wharton, and we're going to talk to him about his new book, Originals, which is about how nonconformists move the world. Adam, welcome to Knowledge at Wharton. Thank you. So you often interview authors in the Authors at Wharton series. So I'm going to start with a question that you usually ask them. What inspired you to write this book? I really want to turn the tables on you on this one. <laughs> but I think the, the inspiration for writing this book was uh, twofold. One, uh, I worked as a manager for a while before I came into academia. And the one time I worked up the courage to speak up uh, I was actually dragged by my boss's boss into the bathroom, and uh, I basically ended up being threatened that I would be fired if I ever spoke my mind again. And I really wanted to know how could I have done that more effectively. And then uh, more recently, uh, since my first book, Give and Take, came out, people have been constantly asking, if I am in a culture where people are constantly selfish or toxic, how do I change that? And if I'm facing undesirable circumstances anywhere, what do I do about them? And I didn't feel like I had good answers for them. So I started doing a lot of research, and uh, here we are. Great. So you, you, you talk uh, about entrepreneurship right at the beginning of the book, uh, especially the company Warby Parker, which you know uh, came out of uh, so, so the efforts of some Wharton students. Uh, when, typically, when people think about entrepreneurs, they see them as ult the ultimate risk takers who are willing to bet the farm on their dreams. Uh, what is your view of entrepreneurship and the relationship between entrepreneurship and risk taking? Well, that's what I thought too initially, right? When I thought of an entrepreneur, I thought of like, you know, sort of a swashbuckling pirate or a daredevil, the kind of person who would basically leap before he or she looked. And the data tell a completely different story that entrepreneurs are not necessarily more risk-taking than the rest of us. Um, in fact, they may even be more risk-averse. Most entrepreneurs hate gambling. What they really enjoy is the opportunity to try something new. And they're typically driven not by this craving for risk, but rather this desire to say, can I pursue a passion? Can I work independently? Can I do something where I'm really going to have an impact? And so what I think what mystifies a lot of us is we look at entrepreneurs and we see them taking risks and we assume they're risk takers. Really, what a lot of them are doing is they're managing risk portfolios. Mm -hmm. So think about it like a stock portfolio, right? If you're going to make a risky investment in one realm, you're supposed to offset that with a safer bet in a different stock. And entrepreneurs actually do the same thing with risk, at least the successful ones do. When they have to go out on a limb in one domain, they will actually be more cautious in another to cover their basis. Now, uh, you also have so many interesting stories in the book. Uh, one that I especially liked was about the internet browsers that people use. Does that say anything about the people who use them and about their uh, originality? It says more than I initially expected. Uh, so this economist, Michael Hausman, was tracking data on customer service reps and call center employees. And he found that employees who use uh, Chrome or Firefox actually outperformed Internet Explorer and Safari users. And they also stayed in their jobs significantly longer. So I started stalking him, of course, to find out why. <laughs> what, what's going on? What does Chrome and Firefox do for you? And it turned out it wasn't a technical advantage. It was not that they were faster at typing, they didn't have more computer knowledge. It was about how you got the browser. If you are going to use Internet Explorer or Safari, it comes pre-installed on your computer, right? Whereas Chrome and Firefox, if you want them, you have to take a little bit of initiative and download a different browser. And that's a signal, a window, around what you do at work. So the kinds of people who had that instinct to say, you know what, I wonder if there's a better browser out there. They were also the kinds of people who looked for ways to improve their own jobs. And ultimately, they were able to create a job where they were more effective and, and more satisfied. Now, people hear about these data, and sometimes they say, well, wait, if I want to get better at my job, all I have to do is upgrade to Chrome or Firefox? <laughs> no, right? It's about the kind of thinking that, that underlies that choice, not just accepting the default that's handed to you, but asking, is there a different or better option available? Now, in uh, thinking about originality, uh, you say the biggest barrier to originality is not the ability to generate ideas, but to select them. Uh, how can people avoid making bad bets when it comes to idea selection? I, I think we're all actually pretty terrible at this when it comes to our own ideas. Right? The, the evidence is overwhelming. There, you, it's hard to find an entrepreneur who doesn't think his or her idea is a winner. 
Um, it's really other people's feedback that turns out to be important. So there's this brilliant research by Justin Berg, uh, one of our former doctoral students who's now on the Stanford faculty. And Justin got circus artists uh, to try to gauge how likely their performances were to succeed with audiences. And they were terrible. Um, they overestimated the success of their own performances by a lot. So then he went to managers, and he showed a bunch of videos, so you get to see some jugglers, you get to see a few clowns. By the way, nobody likes clowns, it turns out, universally hated. Um, you may get to watch a few aerial acrobatics performances, and then the managers make judgments. And the managers are not very accurate either. Um, you tend to be too positive on your own ideas. Managers tend to be too negative on other people's ideas because they have a prototype about what a great circus performance looks like. And they're evaluating all the ideas that come onto the table in terms of does that fit or not. And the group that was much more effective than either people themselves or managers was peers, fellow circus artists. So you might not be able to judge your own ideas, but you're great at forecasting the success of other people's ideas. Because unlike managers, as a performer, you're much more willing to look at an unusual act and say, you know what, I've never seen anything like that before, but that has potential. But you also are willing to say, you know what, this is really bad. So I think we could all rely more on peer feedback and do a better job saying, look, when I've got a new idea, I'm not necessarily going to trust my own judgment, but I'm not always going to trust, especially middle managers who tend to be the most risk averse and most conservative. I'm gonna to go to people who are fellow creators. Right, and you have a couple of great examples of, uh, from the business world uh, of Segway uh, and Seinfeld uh, in, in demonstrating this. Can, can you tell us a little bit about those examples? Yeah, I think the, the Segway example is, is a case, unfortunately, of an entrepreneur being overconfident in an idea. Uh, so the, the short version of the story is you have this idea for a self-balancing vehicle, and you don't really go out and figure out is this something people would want to drive? Would they trust it? Would they buy it? Whereas in Seinfeld, you have the exact opposite. Instead of a sort of a false positive, it's a false negative. So the pilot was rated weak, and it was actually initially scrapped. And then this, uh, this movie executive, excuse me, TV executive, uh, Rick Ludwin, who doesn't even work in comedy, he's from the Variety and Specialist Department, he sees the pilot and he says, this is really good. And he ends up finding a slot for it and using his own budget. And I think what, what Rick did was he was able to step outside of the prototypes that a lot of us tend to use. So people looked at the Seinfeld pilot and they said, it's a show about nothing. And this does not fit the mold of how a, a comedy or a sitcom especially is supposed to run. Whereas Rick had come out of variety, specials, lots of different formats. And he said, you know what? Not every plot has to be resolved. Not every twist needs to go somewhere. The point is to make people laugh. And he was much more open to the potential there. So does that mean that when it comes to idea generation, that quantity is very closely related to quality? Yeah, I think one of the myths that people carry around, if you want to be original, you will think, look, I should do less because I want to perfect my invention or my creation. But again, the data actually support the opposite story. Uh, Dean Simonton's a psychologist who's been studying this his whole career. And what he finds is one of the best predictors of how much creative productivity you will ultimately achieve, how much you're regarded as a genius, is about the number of ideas you produce. So the more ideas you create, the more variety you have. Right? And some of those ideas are going to be blind alleys or random walks in bad directions. But you have a better shot then of stumbling upon something that's really powerful. So for example, when you compare great composers, if you look at Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, it wasn't that their average is so much better than their peers. It's that they generated sometimes 600 or 1,000 different compositions, and a few of those are considered true masterpieces. You can see this not just when comparing different kinds of people, though. You can also pick it up when you look within a person's career. So creators are the most novel, the most original, during the times when they have the most bad ideas. Mm -hmm. Look at Edison, for example. Great example. Edison made a talking doll so creepy that it scared not only children but adults, too. He came up with a fruit preservation technique that failed. He tried to mine um, in a number of ways that didn't work out. And it was during that window where he had a, over 100 failed ideas that he was able to perfect the light bulb. And I think the idea is that you have to generate a lot of garbage to reach greatness. Right. Uh, no, one of the challenges that anyone who comes up with a new idea is going to face is how do you get them heard? And how do you speak truth to power? 
Uh, can you give us some examples of uh, how you can do that uh, while minimizing the risk of damaging your career as, as, as you felt when, at, at the start of our conversation? I could have really used this advice a while <laughs> back. I think one of the, the most important things that I've learned about speaking truth to power is that when we're excited about an idea, we tend to make the mistake of assembling as many reasons as possible to support it. And by the time we pitch it, it seems as if we're completely biased and blinded, right? It's all, this is a good idea, and there's no balance whatsoever in the pitch. Uh, so there's an entrepreneur, Rufus Griscom, who has a great antidote to this. He starts a company called Babbel. It's a parenting website. And he goes to investors, and he says, these are the three reasons you should not back my company. And that year, he walks away with over $3 million US in funding. Two years later, he goes to Disney and says, um, you know, I'm interested in selling this company to you. Here are the five reasons why you should not buy it. And they end up buying it for $40 million. Now, of course, part of this, it's a little bit of an attention-grabbing device, right? You don't expect an entrepreneur to say, here's why you should not trust me. But what's interesting is when Rufus acknowledges the weaknesses of his idea, he looks like he's self-critical and honest. And he also makes it harder for people to come up with their own objections because as they're thinking about their own concerns, they say, you know what, he hit three of my four. This guy must be so confident that he can overcome these issues that he's willing to admit those weaknesses out loud and those strengths must be powerful enough to off offset them. So I think we could all do a better job probably giving a more balanced case for our, our ideas when we speak truth to power. The other thing that I would, I would recommend is to avoid a mistake that I made, which is when I went to speak up in, in my own career, I looked for the friendliest, most agreeable person, mm -hmm. assuming that's the person who's ultimately going to be supportive. But it turned out that that person didn't have my back because just as uh, he was interested in being nice to me, he also wanted to keep the peace with everyone else. Mm -hmm. What I should have done and what the evidence supports is that if you go to a more disagreeable boss, somebody who tends to be a little bit more critical, skeptical, and challenging, yeah, that person's going to be tougher on you, but then they will be also more willing to rock the boat a little bit and stand up for your idea if it's unpopular. Interesting. Uh, when... Is it the right time to exit an organization rather than continuing to make the case for an idea? I think this is a, a problem that a lot of us struggle with. I don't know that I have any answers to it. Um, I do know, though, that if you track what happens to most people who speak up, usually they try voicing their idea. And then if it doesn't work out, they either decide, you know what, I don't have other options and I need to keep this job, or they start to look elsewhere. I think there are a couple of, of tests, though, that are worth running before you decide to leave. The first one is, have I gone to all of the potential allies that I have in the organization? Second one is, is it possible that there's a better way for me to present this idea? And that it's not that people are unwilling to hear it, it's just that they, they didn't see the potential because I didn't speak about it effectively. And then third, and most importantly, the question is, what am I ultimately trying to accomplish? Is this organization the best site for me to reach my goals? And I think if you can answer those three questions, mm, I can't succeed on any of them. It's probably time to start looking around a little bit. Well, sometimes people procrastinate about some of these things. Uh, and you have some interesting ideas about procrastination in your book. Do you see procrastination as a strength or as a weakness? My stance on this has completely changed, uh, par <laughs> partially during the process of writing the book. So I expected, if you want to be an original, you know, the kind of nonconformist who champions new ideas and really drives creativity and change in the world, I thought you had to be an early bird, a first mover. But again, the evidence proved me wrong. Turns out that most originals are great procrastinators. They're constantly putting things off. And uh, actually I actually had a, a former student, Jihei Shin, who showed that if you procrastinate a little bit, you will generate more creative ideas than if you dive right into a task or finish it right away. And the reason for this is pretty simple. Um, and I've actually been a victim of the opposite of it for a while. Uh, so I am actually a procrastinator. Mm -hmm. I'm somebody who, if I know I have something due in six months, I will feel urgent pressure to do it now mm -hmm. and worry about it constantly until the moment that it's done. And what I noticed as I compared that against the originals that I studied, the people that I interviewed, the data that I gathered, was a lot of them were waiting for the right time. And if they put off the start or completion of the task a little bit, they allowed themselves to access more diverse ideas. And they saw possibilities that I wouldn't have seen because our first ideas are our most conventional, typically. 
right? You have to sort of weed out the familiar in order to get to the much more unusual and original. And I wasn't doing that when I dove right into a task. So I've come to believe we should all procrastinate deliberately. Um, but if you push that too far, of course, you're just not going to have time to finish your work. What is strategic procrastination? I think of strategic procrastination as essentially this idea of waiting for the right time. So as a writer, for example, um, I have learned to leave drafts unfinished on purpose. And what I will do is I'll start working on a draft. I really want to spend the next two hours finishing it. I will put it away. And then three days later when I come back, I have seven or eight new ideas that I would never have considered because now it's in the back of my mind. We have a much better memory for incomplete than complete tasks. So the moment I, I sort of hit send on that, on that draft, it's out of my mind, right? Whereas when I leave it open, then I'm constantly processing it. I'm seeing new possibilities. Uh, the other thing I've, I've learned to do over time is I'll finish a draft, but I won't actually submit it or ship it. And I'll leave it sitting for two or three weeks. By the time I come back to it, I have enough distance to say, who wrote this drivel? <laughs> but, but I also then, again, am able to approach it with a fresh perspective. And for me, that's what strategic procrastination is all about. I mean, especially uh, in, in writing, when you say something at the heat of, in, the, in, the, in the heat of the moment, in the heat of writing, uh, you don't have enough distance to be objective about it. But exactly. By waiting, it, uh, I got very similar advice from one of my early editors uh, in my career, and I've always appreciated that. I think it's wonderful advice as long as we find that sweet spot, right, of procrastinating <laughs> enough to allow the ideas to exactly. incubate, but not so much that you run out of time and you just have to pick the simplest idea. Exactly. Now, Einstein believed that uh, people are most creative when they are young. Is that true? It seemed to be true for Einstein, um, but not for most of the rest of us. Uh, so uh, the story of Einstein is actually pretty sad if you look at it. So transforms physics not once but twice with special and general relativity. Mm -hmm. And then he ends up opposing the next major revolution in physics, which is quantum mechanics. And ironically, his opposition to it is debunked because he forgot to account for his own theory of relativity. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, so Einstein said, reflecting on this experience, that to punish him for, uh, for testing and challenging authority, the fates made him author an authority himself. And I think that suggests that at some point we are all doomed once we have internalized ideas to essentially lose our creativity. Um, when you study, though, great scientists, musicians, poets, artists, what you see is that there are basically two cycles. Um, one is basically sort of the young genius, and this is the Einstein. Somebody who comes into a field, accumulates knowledge really quickly, but also has enough distance to not drink the Kool-Aid. And that person ends up with a flash of insight coming up with a wildly different way of looking at the world. And yeah, if that's your style, you're at risk for becoming too entrenched and starting to take for granted so many assumptions that you can't really think differently in that field anymore. But there's a second path, which was the old master. And these are the people who tended to work much more experimentally. They were doing lots of little trials and errors. They were doing tests. They were iterating. And they were learning from the data as opposed to having these eureka moments. And they actually tended to peak frequently in their 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s and 80s in some cases. So I think there is hope for those of us who are more tortoise than hare. <laughs> um, how can originality be sustained over time? I think one of the, the challenges that we all face if we want to sustain originality is we have to keep our exposure to fresh ideas. And the longer you spend in a field, an organization, a job, the more familiar certain things will become. And so you have to push yourself outside of that comfort zone. How do you do that? There's a, a study I really enjoy uh, by Frederick uh, Godard and his colleagues where they actually track uh, fashion designers and they look at what predicts which fashion houses have the most creative and original designs. And it turns out one of the best predictors of that is, has the creative director of that fashion house lived abroad? Mm -hmm. But then if you break down the data, it goes further. Living abroad alone is not enough. You have to work abroad. You actually have to use the ideas of the culture, right? Not just sort of visit and enjoy it as a, tur a tourist. You have to internalize how that culture thinks and looks at things differently. And then working abroad, you can break that down further and say it's more beneficial for your creativity and originality if you work abroad in countries that are more different from your own if you, and if you stay there longer. 
So that kind of breadth is what we're looking for. How do you simulate that? I think what a lot of us can do is we could do a much better job with the job rotation, for example. So in your own organization, spend two days doing a job that you've never done before. Gives you a completely fresh perspective on the work. Go to a site visit to a different organization or even a company that's in a different field from your own, a different industry, and all of a sudden you have lots of ideas that you can apply to your own work. Uh, what role do coalitions play in bringing original ideas to life? We all need allies. <laughs> it's very hard to be a lone original. Uh, I think Derek Sivers put it well. Uh, one follower is what tra uh, transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, no, nobody wants to be that lone nut. Uh, I think many of us, though, assume that we need large coalitions to support our ideas. But most of the time, research by our own Seagal Barsaid shows that even a single ally, a single friend, is enough to make you feel that you're not lonely. And so I think coalitions typically are much more about finding that very, very small group of people who believe in you and are willing to give your ideas a shot, as opposed to saying, I need to get 74% of this organization on board. Um. You also talk about something called a Trojan horse strategy for coalition building. What's that? Well, this was introduced to me by uh, Meredith Perry, uh, who's a, a brilliant entrepreneur. Uh, she's the founder of UBeam, which is trying to bring wireless power to the world. And when Meredith started her company, she had this idea that you could actually transmit, transmit electricity through the air uh, and power up different kinds of devices, phones, computers, uh, without any kind of cord. And people didn't believe her. She tried to hire the very best engineers because she couldn't build the product on her own. And they said, that's impossible. It defies the laws of physics. She was convinced that they were wrong. So in order to get them to come on board, she changed her pitch to them. Instead of saying, I'm trying to build wireless power. Can you make me this kind of transducer? She just said, I'm trying to build a transducer. Can you make me this part? And she actually disguised her purpose because it was too radical for most people to understand. And then a bunch of engineers came on board, and she was able to work with them to make it happen. And what she did was she smuggled her real vision, in that case, inside a Trojan horse, right? She's really trying to build wireless power, but she has a bunch of people working on different pieces that ultimately will come together for a different outcome than they intend. And I think the more radical, the more original your idea is, the more important it is to make sure that people aren't dissuaded by the end and instead focus them on perhaps a more moderate goal that they think is plausible. Uh, does originality have um, roots in family? Uh, does, uh, for example, does birth order matter in originality? It matters more than I expected going in. There's a huge debate about birth order, and I would say the jury is still out overall, but there is compelling evidence that firstborns on average tend to be a little bit smarter and a little bit more likely to achieve conventional success in fields like politics and science. Uh, we have more elected officials who are firstborn, for example. Uh, we also have more Nobel Prize winning scientists. However, when it comes to originality, completely changing the way that a field operates or introducing a new technology, there does appear to be a later born advantage. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that later borns are given more freedom. So by the time you, know, you have three or four older siblings, you're allowed to do a lot of things that they weren't allowed to do growing up, and you get to take some risks. The other thing that happens is some of the more conventional achievement niches are filled. So you, know, you may have an older sibling who's the academic star and one who's an athlete, and you need to find other ways to differentiate yourself, and one of those can be creativity. Uh, I, I was interested in tracking this, uh, as you know, with comedians. Uh, so I took Comedy Central's list of the 100 um, greatest stand-up comics of all time, which had some great originals, people like uh, Chris Rock, George Carlin, Jerry Seinfeld. And I studied their birth order and found that they were more than twice as likely to be born last in their families as first. And the odds of that happening by chance alone are two in a million. So I think there, there is perhaps a, an advantage for later borns in originality. As a firstborn, I was not excited by this research. But the good news is that birth order effects are not set in stone, right? So giving children the kinds of freedom, encouraging them to find unique niches to express themselves, I think can push all of us, even us firstborns, in a more original direction. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I wonder if you could talk about that in a little more detail. How can parents uh, nurture more originality uh, among their children? Well, I think role models play an important part of this process. So 
What a lot of children do is they become unoriginal because they've only been exposed to models or standards who are very familiar and conventional, right? So children grow up, they see lots of engineers, doctors, lawyers, teachers, and they say, that's what I want to do too. As parents, we can open up more original niches by exposing children to a much wider variety of occupations, careers, ideas. And some of the most original possibilities are not going to exist yet, which is why when you listen to what some of the great originals in the technology world say, they will frequently identify their inspiration in science fiction. Uh, books like Ender's Game. Uh, now we're probably going to see more Harry Potter references <laughs> when we ask the next generation of entrepreneurs, what inspired you? But it's amazing how many inventions come out of fictional stories. And I think we could do a much better job making sure that children are exposed to lots of ideas that don't exist yet. So that when they see, for example, the next generation of somebody using what looks a lot like a mobile phone in a 1960s Star Trek episode, they say, you know what, I want to go out and create that. You know, when you consider families or even companies, one of the biggest problems seems to be groupthink. How, how does that come about and how can you prevent it? A lot of people attribute groupthink to cohesion. They think that if we're too close, if we trust each other too much, Mukul, if you and I like each other too much, then we're not going to challenge each other. That turns out to be false. Um, cohesive groups often make the best decisions, and people frequently, when they trust each other, are willing to challenge each other and say, I know this person is not going to take this too personally. But if you're not careful, cohesion can take you down a path toward groupthink when people become more concerned about politics and about maintaining their relationships and reputations than about speaking their minds and being honest. So most leaders try to combat this by assigning devil's advocates. Right? I know that there's a majority preference in the room, so I'm going to assign one person to be the, the opposite. Devil's advocates, according to the research, don't work very well most of the time. Charlon Nemeth at Berkeley has been studying this for over four decades. And what she shows is devil's advocates make two mistakes. One is they tend to give lip service to an idea, but they don't really believe in it, so they don't sell it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when devil's advocates speak, people know they're just playing a role, right? I don't need to take you seriously. Okay, I pretended to advocate for this <laughs> position, and now we can go back to the majority preference. Instead of assigning a devil's advocate, I think what we all need to do is unearth a devil's advocate. Genuine dissenters, people who actually hold the minority opinion, we need to find those people, we need to invite them into the conversation and give them a voice. And what's so powerful about that is it turns out minority opinions are useful even when they're wrong. So let's say we're gonna hire one of four candidates and almost everybody in the room prefers candidate A and candidate B is really the best one. If someone comes in and advocates for candidate C, we will have a better shot at choosing ultimately the right candidate of B. Because when divergent information comes to the table, we're much more likely to reevaluate our assumptions, consider new criteria, and make a better decision. To, to just uh, conclude this uh, fascinating conversation, uh, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about how organizations can create a culture of nurturing originality. Uh, if you can offer some practical advice. Originality thrives as opposed to being stifled. There are a couple things to do. One is you have to make it safe for people to fail. You have to make it okay for ideas to come up that don't go anywhere. Because if you squash all the bad ideas, you're going to miss out on some of your most original possibilities. A second step that, that turns out to be really critical if you care about originality in your organization, and especially if you want it to be a core part of the culture, is you have to think differently about hiring. A lot of leaders hire on culture fit. They say, look, I want people who share our values, who match the culture. And that's actually a recipe for groupthink. You hire a bunch of people who look at problems in the same way, who have the same opinions, the same principles. IDEO, the design firm, has, I think, a compelling alternative to this. They say, look, we're going to throw cultural fit out the window. Instead, we look for cultural contribution. Mm -hmm. So when we hire, we're not looking for people who are going to replicate or clone the culture. We're going to find people who enrich the culture. And the test of that is to figure out what's missing from your culture and then try to bring in people who can, who can embody that. And then the, I think the third thing to do if you want to build a culture of originality is you need to challenge the status quo a lot. You need to get people, uh, as Bob Sutton at Stanford would say, feeling comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm 
And one of my favorite ways of doing that is uh, from Lisa Bodell at FutureThink. Uh, she actually runs this kill the company exercise where she brings leaders together and has them spend maybe an hour or two brainstorming ways to put their own company out of business. Now, I've seen this done in um, financial services and pharmaceutical companies, and I have never seen executives so excited as when they finally <laughs> get to, to trash their own employer. But what's interesting about it is it shifts their mindset because they start to think about instead of playing defense and protecting themselves against competitive threats, they're on offense, and they get to try all these new possibilities and drill into them. And then after that, when they shift back to thinking, how do I defend against these threats? They have much more creativity at their disposal. So I think that's a, a good example of, of shaking things up a little bit. Adam, thanks so much for speaking with Knowledge at Wharton today. Thank you. 